middle-aged than men, but actually probably uh, it's even more in other in populations of women. So almost half of those guys were prescribed opioids. And, and as you can see, there are a big percentage of them also prescribed benzodiazepines. And that mix of opioids plus the benzodiazepines is particularly worrisome um, in terms of risk of people having overdose. And you can see there that if people are in like university practices, they're less likely to have these prescriptions for opioids than if they're in a community clinic. I'm interested in what the different Uh, in chronic pain, um, but and we now we have people in our practices. I said in my case, a bunch of them are people I started on those opioids, and others have come to me on those regimens. And we're in the middle of what is probably maybe the biggest sudden reversal in practice um, that uh, any of us can remember. Uh, going from uh, it's okay to prescribe uh, chronic opioids to now. Um, you know, very, very heavy kind of sanctions and a lot of scrutiny on this. Um, so I think our struggle, our um, challenge uh, as, as clinicians and partnering with the people we take care of is how to get to a place where we're prescribing more safely, using, for sure, using less of opioids than we have, but without, you know, turning so fast that we throw our patients overboard um, and leave them alone struggling with what to do with their pain, because the pain is real. The pain is real, and um, the struggle to get from a place of, of uh, that you know that my two patients I described to you there, um, to a place where they're actually comfortable and able to live their lives. It's a hard, hard struggle. So next one. Now we need to acknowledge that it's not all about buprenorphine, and I want to say that, and then we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about buprenorphine. But um, there's a lot of things. This is a short list, actually, of the things that we need to kind of work with people around. Um, um, to uh, that all make a big difference in terms of basically people need to have a life that they can invest in um, uh, aside from pain, um, so that um, uh, so that they're they're um, coping. They have something to cope for, um, and all of these are things that our, if our clinics need to be really good at figuring out how to address these issues for people. Um, I think the meaningful so, um, social connections is something that we don't talk to people enough about. Who are your friends? What are you doing? Who's your family? How are you connected? And then the somatic engagement. There's something about, doesn't even matter what it is, what tradition it is, but something about exercise um, and learning to cope with some pain uh, related, but the good kind of pain that happens when you stretch and use your muscles. Those are all things that really make a big difference in uh, people managing their pain. So now moving on to what about buprenorphine? So um, there's been interest in using buprenorphine, especially for addiction, people who are struggling with opioid addictions um, in clinic. But it, we also know that buprenorphine is a good medicine for pain. It's much safer than the other opioids. And it is, um, you can mix it with the, with the agonist opioids um, for acute pain. It is not something that is easily abused. There are a lot of good reasons to use buprenorphine for pain too. And yet, even in HIV clinics where we see a lot of pain, we're not using as much of it as we would anticipate. Next, one, next slide, Nishi. Sorry, next slide, Kamisha. Good. So I just was going to suggest here, here are five things that I think are frequent challenges to people using buprenorphine in their clinic. And I want to talk through them for a second, and I'm going to ask you all to vote on which one you think is the biggest one. Um, in the biggest one in your clinic. So the first one being that patients, that people are scared to switch off their opioids. They're scared that they're not gonna get good pain control. And they don't really necessarily know about what this buprenorphine is. Buprenorphine is. Now, um, also prescribers aren't necessarily comfortable using buprenorphine. Um, I think that the fact that they need a special kind of license, the fact that it's used both for pain and addiction, um, all those kinds of things confuse people, I think. Um, that that um, 
we need to be careful about starting buprenorphine so that uh, getting, getting people induced on buprenorphine, which can be a, in some cases a several day process is hard in a clinic. And then um, in my experience, there are some groups, some staff, uh, some in my hospital, for instance, there are a number of physician managers and also uh, people's families who feel like buprenorphine is not a good treatment because it's just substituting one addiction for another. Um, each of these is something that could be part of why it's hard to get a buprenorphine program working in, in your setting. So let's go ahead to the next slide. Um, because we're having some challenges here, I'm gonna ask you not to vote for, for your top three challenges, but let's just put in one. So on the next slide, you're gonna have an opportunity to look, uh, actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to Kamisha to explain to us how to do this poll next. Kamisha, can you? Sure, so, yep. So I'm gonna share in the chat box the link to the polling. Once you click the link, it should open up to this, so you'll see this screen. I'm um, sorry, you'll see uh, um, options to vote. And once you vote, we'll be able to see it here um, real time what your option selections are. So if you get the link, please click on the link. Um, it's in the chat box. You, once you click on it, you'll be sent to the, um, the voting options and we'll be able to see it. So take a second here, just check okay. out your number one. What do you think? is the number one reason. Oh. Interesting. So we'll give people just another another few seconds here to click on the link and, and give us your vote. Very interesting. I thought more people would be worried about where to get inductions done, and I'm happy to see that that doesn't seem to be people, at least not people's number one problem. Right, I think we're settling on, uh, looks like number one is is worried that patients don't want to switch off their opioids. But that's by far the most common one. Um, and then that uh, provider, prescriber um, comfort, then there's, it's uh, head and head, neck and neck between confusion over use for pain versus addiction, and then the fact that there's not support across all our communities for, um, for the use of buprenorphine. All right, looks like we, I think we've done it. Thank you for participating in the poll. Then let's go ahead and talk about some of these, uh, some of these possibilities then. So I'm gonna ask um, in the chat, um, uh, if people if we can, if we can have a volunteer, somebody can wave at me um, on the Hollywood Squares to talk a little bit about the, 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 the our number one concern was people don't, uh, patients don't want to come off opioids. So can somebody um, in the Hollywood Squares wave who's interested in sharing with us, what do you do about that? How do you approach talking to patients about um, why it might be worthwhile for them to consider that? And if your webcam is not on, go ahead and just take yourself off mute and um, you can go ahead and start speaking. Mm -hmm. Valerie, um, Valerie, I'm wondering if you would be willing to um, to be our our uh, first first person here to to speak up, um, I can't tell exactly where you're from here, but uh, Valerie Al Hashem, can you unmute yourself and just talk to us a little bit about how you all are are struggling with this? You may be muted on your phone. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. There we go. Yep. Okay. Well, the speakerphone does not work, but um, I'm here with my colleague, Cecil King. He's going to wave to you there. And we actually selected the, the second choice. Mm -hmm. The prescribers are not comfortable. Go for it. And 
that's what we have going on in our practice. I wrote in the chat room that we have a physician retiring um, at the end of the year, and she has a number of patients with chronic pain to whom she's been prescribing opioids for a number of years. And the other, her colleagues and the incoming provider are not at her same comfort level with treating pain. So we're all in this quandary together of what are we going to do to transition those patients, not just off of their OxyContin and onto buprenorphine, but from one provider to another. So mm -hmm. two challenges at once. <laughs> Yeah. Have you guys been talking about how you're going to, how you think you're going to handle that? We have been talking about it, but there are only two other people within the practice that have the buprenorphine um, prescriber certificate. So mm -hmm. ideally we want everybody on the same page because her patients are going to be distributed across the, mm -hmm. uh, her colleagues. Mm -hmm. So you'd like it to really go smoothly but we're we're encountering you know different <laughs> different perspectives on that. Um, I just so went to the calendar request. Yeah, Th thanks very much for that, Valerie. Hang on, the line that's here. Somebody else wanted to talk to. Let's see if we can get a dialogue going here. I don't know if I can switch you back to speaker without losing you. Dr. Clanner, this is yeah. Oh. Hi, Nishi. A chat in the chat box saying that she is inside of a, a cubicle setting. She can't speak and she really wants to share her experience. So I asked yeah. her to type it in the chat so that you can read it to the audience. Yeah, I can see Stacy. Um, Stacy saying that their clinic changed the policy with prescribing opioids and they've contracted with a pain management clinic and they treat the chronic pain issues. So I'm guessing, Valerie, that that's probably something that you guys have, one of the things that you pro have probably thought about is uh, is um, linking up or getting help from a pain management specialist. Anybody else wanna, want to talk about what they voted for in terms of their challenge? Thank you very much, Valerie, by the way, and Stacy. Anybody else want to share what it is, that either what they're struggling with or how they're addressing this challenge? Is there anybody who feels like they have really got it, got it under control or, or really have, uh, feel comfortable with how they're approaching it in their clinic, or they want to share a good strategy with us? Well, I think that this is a really, really challenging issue. Um, let's go back to the slides, Kamisha. And just have a few kind of hints or um, really where my clinic is also in the middle of trying to, uh, to deal with this problem. So there's, um, in terms of thinking about how we can approach it, there are um, these le different levels of problem solving. There's how we approach patients, about getting access to buprenorphine or pain treatments that are not buprenorphine. There's um, what we need to do to support providers. And then at the system level, kind of changing people's minds and kind of trying to reduce the, um, the stigma that has to do with, um, with, you know, with pain and use of chronic opioids. So there's really all three um, different levels at which we might be able to engage and, and make some change happen. Next one. So, so just um, to circle back to the two clients that we talked about, Robin, you remember, was somebody who has um, a has um, uh, the scoliosis and uh, was on a lot of opioids. She actually was able, when I talked to her um, about this and told her that I was worried about what she was using, was pretty clear it was not working for her. It took us a few conversations together. Of, um, of doing motivational interviewing and talking with her about what does she want to be different in her life. She really wanted to be able to go back to work and also wanted to be more present to her kids. She was tired all the time because of the opioids and was not able to really be present to her kids who were in their teens. 
So those were her motivations for going through the difficult weaning off of her soma. And then the switch from the oxy to the buprenorphine was actually fairly smooth with her. Um, she uh, has less pain now. She's doing regular physical therapy in Cairo and has a lot less pain in her back um, and finds that the buprenorphine really controls that well. What she misses is the, um, she's having a harder time sleeping now, but she is much more active and feels she has less pain in her body. Marlene, um, we were, uh, uh, was able to wean her down to a lower dose um, on, the, on the, um, the Norco that she was taking. Um, and uh, she's, on, she's also on um, some buprenorphine, so she's kind of on a mix now. And uh, she and I are negotiating about whether, um, she can see, whether she can see a life for herself where she's completely off the opioids or, or whether um, that is just too stressful a thought for her. Um, she tells me that her family has told her, is giving her a lot of props for having weaned down off her medicine. They can see how much, uh, how much more present she is uh, to their life with her. And I think um, that is a motivator for her. It would not surprise me at all if in the next few years she manages to get all the way off everything. So um, I think what I, uh, the, the um, options that you all have brought up in terms of bringing in some outside expertise in terms of pain management, um, uh, working with providers to become more comfortable to use buprenorphine, and then really it's one-on-one -on -one patient problem solving and listening really fiercely to our patients and clients about what they need from us um, to be able to, what they're reaching for. It makes it worth it for them to be able to get off of these medicines. So let's see, I heard, I saw in the chat, I think Nishi was telling me that Caitlin has a question. Caitlin, can you yeah. unmute yourself? Yeah, sure. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm with a aid service organization and I'm not, I'm just not very clear about the, um, I guess the medical nitty-gritty. Um, I've not even heard of that before, but we do have a lot of problems with our um, clients who are, you know, have chronic pain and the doctors that we work with don't want to prescribe um, opioids. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the drug itself mm -hmm. and what that is. Well, I, I think, um, Laurie, how are we doing on time here? I, I would say go ahead and give the um, a big picture overview and then we'll go ahead and transition into the case presentation. Okay. Mostly what I'm going to do, Caitlin, is tell you where you can find out more about it. Perfect. But I'm glad that you're asking that question. Mm -hmm. So the basic thing is that buprenorphine, which is a terrible name, which is really hard to pronounce. Most people call it bup. Um, that buprenorphine is an alternative um, opioid, an alternative pain medicine, and it also works to treat um, addiction cravings. Um, it is in the same family as, you know, opioids like, um, like, you know, hydrocodone and oxy. It's, it's an, it is also an, an opioid, but its chemistry is different in that um, it uh, is, it does not suppress respiration and it doesn't make you feel kind of high or dreamy in the same way that that the other pain medicines do. So um, it is essentially virtually impossible to overdose on, which is great. Um, and because it doesn't make people as high, it tends to be, people don't abuse it as much. They don't overdose, they don't wanna take more than they, than they need. Um, so it's safer um, and is, um, has a number of other advantages over the regular opioids. <clears throat> the one that I talk, that we don't talk about a lot, but I talk to my patients about a lot, is that opioid pain medicines suppress your sex drive, whether you're a man or a woman. Um, they, su they suppress your interest in that. And um, taking buprenorphine, actually, those hormones come roaring back. And that's another way that people kind of wake up after they switch over. So you will find a lot about buprenorphine if you search for something called MAT, the initials MAT. It stands for Medication Assisted Therapy, and it means treatment of addiction with medicines. So it's, I, the shortest way to say it is, I think I would probably say that it's like a space age methadone. Okay, great, perfect, thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kathleen. And um, if there's any uh, any resources that we could go ahead and either put right into the chat room or we can post them afterwards in glass cubes, we'll make sure that we have that out to everybody so you can find a little bit more information about buprenorphine.